When you go to the YouTube homepage, it'll show blank boxes as placeholders instead of thumbnails, titles, and profile pictures for a short time before the actual content appears. The short explanation for this is that it takes longer to generate user-specific content, and developers are trying to keep a balance between the speed of the initial page load and the changes in layout as additional data comes in. But there's a lot of interesting tech at play here. Companies go to great lengths to make your initial experience with their website as quick and comfortable as possible. And it's not just YouTube. Amazon will start showing the layout of the homepage, including any discount tags, before it even knows what content will be there. And Netflix will put placeholder rows for shows before it even knows what it's going to recommend. Steam also shows these placeholder blocks before the content is actually loaded. And YouTube even works when you don't have internet. That's commitment right there. But if you do have internet and you're watching this video, please don't forget to subscribe. Anticipating the layout before the content has actually been calculated is just one of the many things that these companies do to make websites load or appear to load faster. In 2006, Amazon found that for every 100 milliseconds they could reduce from their page load, their revenue would increase by 1%. At Amazon scale, that is a huge amount of money. You may have heard of click-through rate before. It's quite a common metric here on YouTube. Trying to optimize this statistic has caused many clickbait thumbnails and titles to be created. On YouTube, impression click-through rate is the percentage of people who see a video's thumbnail and click on it. For a normal website though, click-through rate is the number of people who see an advertisement or link and click on it. Click-through rate is just the first of many statistics that companies are trying to optimize as part of their user acquisition journey. Companies will often model the user's journey as a funnel, where every notch on the funnel represents a point where a user may leave. At the top of the funnel is all the impressions. In a lot of cases, this is just all the users who see an advertisement. And at every step, only a certain percentage of people will proceed. The ultimate goal is to have as many users as possible reach the bottom of the funnel. This is usually a very specific call to action, like buying something or filling out details. The first gate in the funnel is the click-through rate we discussed, since visiting the website is the first action a user could possibly take. A typical click-through rate for an advertisement is 2%. So for a website with 100,000 impressions, only 2,000 people will actually click on the link provided. But the second gate in the funnel comes earlier than you might expect. Even though 2,000 people may click the link in the advertisement, even fewer of them will actually see the website and an even smaller amount will do anything once they get there. Users are impatient, and a significant portion of users will leave before the website has even had a chance to make its first impression. Loading as fast as possible and giving the user a positive experience while doing so is a crucial part of the acquisition process. When a user clicks on a link, their browser makes a request to a server somewhere. The browser and the server will take some time to establish a connection, after this, the browser can request data and the server will return it. Usually, the server will return a mix of HTML, CSS, and JavaScript files. HTML is a markup language that defines the layout of the website. Sometimes you may have experienced a caching issue when loading a website, and you may have seen a page without any styling. This page is what HTML defines. CSS defines the styling of all the components in the HTML file. This is what changes that boring template into something that's nicer to look at. JavaScript lets developers add logic to their website. It's more complicated and slower than HTML and CSS, but it is much more powerful. HTML and CSS are declarative, meaning they tell the browser what is there and the browser displays it. There is no additional calculations needed. JavaScript tells the browser how to do something and the browser must execute those steps itself. This is why JavaScript is slower. For the initial page load, pure HTML and CSS will be faster than JavaScript. A lot of websites require complex logic, so developers often use frameworks to create entire websites using only JavaScript. These websites will send what is essentially a blank HTML file that fetches a JavaScript file. The JavaScript code will execute to populate the website components as necessary. Technically, the website is already loaded when the first HTML file is received, but all the user will see is a blank page until the JavaScript code is fetched and run to display all the required data. Sometimes it can be more meaningful to measure how long it takes for the content to be rendered, including any JavaScript that needs to be executed. 
The connection between the browser and the server works using packets to send information, but developers can also use this to their advantage. The initial connection that's established between the server and browser takes three packets, but it has some room to spare. If a website is less than 14 kilobytes, the entire website can be sent during the connection phase, removing the need for an additional request before the page is loaded. Using this technique, developers can send a very basic page as quickly as possible, and further requests can be used to populate the rest of the data. 14 kilobytes is not a lot of space. A common technique to reduce the size of files sent by the server is minifying. This is usually done using a tool that reduces the size of files by removing redundant characters and using smaller variable names. These tools can also incorporate some language-specific techniques to save characters. While normal HTML, CSS, and JavaScript files are very human-readable, with clear variable names, spacing, and new lines, minified files are written with no spaces, all on one line, and with one-letter variable names. This makes them much more difficult to debug, but makes no difference for the browser who reads the files to display them. For example, a normal CSS file is normally written with one property per line, with spacing around colons. This makes it easier to read and maintain. But a minified CSS file will contain all properties on a single line, with no spaces. We can do this because the language uses semicolons to denote new lines. None of the languages used by the browser really care about white space. This can be taken a step further in JavaScript. JavaScript contains user-defined variables. These variables are usually written with clear, pronounceable names, but minifying will take these names and replace them with smaller alternatives. It will also replace JavaScript code with a smaller equivalent where it detects improvements. Another common technique used to reduce the size of packets is compression. Compression algorithms take the files on the server and compress them before they are sent. This is very similar to zipping a file on your desktop. Compression algorithms leverage the fact that some sequences of characters will occur more frequently than others to reorganize the data in a more efficient way. This is a very rudimentary explanation, but if I look at a paragraph of text and notice that the word frog occurs very frequently, but the letter X doesn't occur at all, I can send a table that tells the receiver that I'm replacing all instances of the word frog with the letter X. When done efficiently and with some smarter algorithm, this can greatly reduce the size of files. All major browsers support a few compression algorithms. The server specifies which one is used and the browser will unzip the data when it is loaded. Obviously, this is extra work for the browser, but the benefit of smaller packets during transit usually outweighs the cost of unzipping files. The only thing better than sending very little data is to send none at all. This can be done with caching. If a file is not expected to change in the future, the server can inform the browser to store it. Any request to the same endpoint will use the stored value instead of fetching a new one. This is how the YouTube page can appear to load without any internet. The error page is saved on my browser and will display when a request fails. If I started a brand new browser session and had never visited YouTube before, this data would never have been received before and the normal browser error page is shown. So far, these techniques have been focused around reducing the initial page load, which is very important, but only works once the data is ready to be sent to the user. For static data, or data that is the same for everybody, the mentioned techniques alone can be used to achieve the desired loading speed. But websites often need to display user-specific content. In all the examples mentioned, the data was curated specifically for me. This is why it could not be sent immediately. Getting the right content displayed to the user as early as possible is also very important. My YouTube homepage will be unique to me. YouTube can optimize the initial page load, but it takes much longer to decide my recommendations. Users are impatient, and it's important for them to know that everything is working correctly. A common technique used to solve this is a loading bar or icon. This shows the user that something is happening in the background and can even show them some sort of progress. Loading animations have a few problems though. They don't do a great job at telling the user what is actually happening. The user has to trust the website. Having a loading animation can also result in drastic changes once the data is loaded. This can be jarring for the users. There's nothing more frustrating than trying to click on a button while a page is loading, only for the page to shift out from under you and you end up clicking on something else. Developers reduce the amount of layout shift 
by filling the page with smaller loading screens, ideally with dummy data, while the page is still loading. Even for websites with user-specific content, the layout usually follows the same kind of pattern, with videos in the same grid, even if we don't know what video will be there yet, and discounts in the same positions, even if we don't know what the discounts are yet. Developers can improve the user experience by preempting the layout of the page and filling it with dummy data. This shows the user that they clicked on the right website and that something is happening, while keeping the layout of the page consistent as the website continues to load. Once the data is loaded, they can fill in the blank boxes with the actual data. They can even batch requests, so the most important parts of the layout are filled in first. This is what Netflix does by filling in one row at a time. If a website knows the content layout ahead of time, it can move as much of the page as possible to be raw HTML and CSS, so that the server returns this data directly and the browser can start showing the page. In the background, the server will continue to fetch additional data specific to the user in question, but the page already appears to have loaded for the user. Once the data has been calculated, the browser can execute JavaScript code to fill in the data as necessary. This is all to create a more fluid experience for the user. These websites are trying their best to convince you to wait, hoping that you won't leave before it has a chance to show you your content. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe.